Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Martin Drive Show and welcome back to our continued coverage of the Russia and Ukraine war. Today we're going to be tuning back in with Dennis Daydov and getting another overview of the front lines and some operations and some weapons technologies and an all around idea of what's been going on the last couple of days within this war. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get right on into the news. Hello my friends and welcome, let's go for the front lines update at first and we have awesome news. Ukraine again crossed the Dnieper river to the enemy side. I'm not speaking about the Antonovsky bridge over here where Ukraine did it before, now we have the new direction, it's called Kazachi Lahari in this area. Yes, we don't have the military map update for that situation, however I know also from the Russian resources that they had to retreat from this area and partially surrender this territory. Well, not all of the village of Kazachi Lahiri is under control by Ukrainian forces, but Ukrainian warriors were able to land over there, creating the first point of logistics. I Looking at this map, I think this new operation or new point of attack and its success um, provides some important information. It seems that they had to cross not just the Dnieper River, but this little Konka waterway. I don't know if that's also a river. And by doing so, that means they have successfully um, attacked through bodies of water. And typically bodies of water, such as rivers, are used as points of defense. That's why on this, I guess, not updated war map, the Russian front lines was set along the river. So them being pushed back will actually allow Russian forces to, I think, easier advance through Kazachi Lurie and easier be able to seize their village back because now they're able to get forces across the river without being attacked as they've set up a new front line. So I think the situation itself is very interesting to keep in uh, you know, contact with, keeping news with, but also just the fact that Ukraine has been successful at delivering an operation so far through, you know, not one, but it seems two bodies of water to attack Russian forces, I think is just a key note to keep down. I would say that it's the most important news for the last few weeks. If you subscribe for my Telegram channel, you already know some information about the case. Even the video was presented how our soldiers went across the Dnieper River and landed on the enemy side. This is not a fake, those are the real images of our warriors. So if you want to see all of that, I highly recommend... I just wanted to pause to, to look at the soldiers and then take a moment to realize how different uh, you know that body of water is in person than it is you know on a map on a map That's just a little sliver. It's not massive But when you're in person and on the battlefield, it's not like you can just quickly swim across there You can't just you know paddle a boat across or anything along those lines what you have to do is set up a strong strategic attack to get rid of their defenses on the other side to be able to cross and i'm not a military expert so i don't know how they successfully did it but the fact that they crossed that body of water i mean just look at how far that is it's incredible i recommend you to subscribe for my telegram channel you may find the link in the video description just below we are still in lack of the information of how much territory ukraine was able to get the russian side says that one third of kazachi lahari is under control by ukrainian forces and their forces had to retreat because mostly there were mobilized russian men controlling this area a couple of weeks ago there were elite forces from the russian paratroop divisions but they were sent to zaporizhia direction and mobilized soldiers are not so motivated to fight against the ukrainian army so what they did, they retreat from this area and Ukraine took as much territory as they could with the forces available. I'm sure that there will be some backup for Ukrainian forces and this bridge hold will be increased. Up to very interesting, the Ukrainian strategy. It's not just interesting, it's very smart. Um, by attacking a different part of the map, Where I just wanted to get rid of the blurriness. Um, they forced, you know, more elite Russian forces to go to a different area of the battlefield. In turn, they noticed those forces moved and are now attacking where those forces left because it's been weakened. And that makes sense why getting across the river was easier. It's not as defended as I thought it was. However, it shows really 
it seems like Ukraine's playing chess or Russia's playing checkers. I mean, Russia had their defenses, then they moved their defenses, now they're getting attacked somewhere else. So are they just going to move their defenses back, going like that? Or is Russia going to develop a different plan? I guess that's the new question ball is in their court. We may reach this road. It is actually the biggest supply road on the southern part of Ukraine. Apparently, Kazach Lahiri is located around two and a half kilometers away from this very important road. I think that potentially Ukraine has resources to move towards this road and cut supplies for Russia, especially after the recent attacks on the Crimean bridges in Hinichinsk and Chongar disabling the Russian logistics across the Sivash Lake. To understand everything, we need to see the bigger picture. The railroad bridge was cut, it was damaged and no longer in use by the Russian Federation. The Chungar Bridge, as I say to you, plus Hinichings were kaput, so all of this area is without supplies. So what they need to use is this road across Armansk that goes very close to Oleshki and then goes over here. After it, it leads to Melitopol city. But here is the deal. Ukraine, as I say to you today, landed on the enemy shore in Kazachi Lahiri, very close to that road. 2.5 kilometers is really not a big distance. In that case, we may cut this road. So this part is cut already and this one will be cut hopefully. Based on that, Russia may lose the supplies for all of this region. Where you so essentially with the idea being to cut off the road and they've already blown up these bridges, which is it's going to take time to repair on its own, um, you'd be able to, I think, continue to push this wall of defense and if you tried to completely cut it off through the center maybe then you could just work your way backwards while maintaining a front line but i'm not a military strategist i know i like pretending to be one so i'm not sure how ukraine will go about that but clearly cutting off supplies will enable them to make a plan in order to not just cut off the supplies but cut off the forces and eventually I would imagine to recapture even more land before uh, the so-called muddy season arrives. Ukraine is performing the counteroffensive operation. We know that Russia has huge problems with logistics. It is the weakest spot of their army. It always was. And based on the situation they're currently facing, I don't see any sort of the solutions for them. Well, you may say that they may still use the Berdansk poor, but they lost many of the landing ships. Yes, they still have a couple of those landing ships in the Black Sea and they may potentially use them to deliver their army. But the Berdansk port is under constant fire control by Ukrainian army. Ukraine continued to use the long-range cruise missiles to target this point. So if Russia wants to get rid of one more big landing ship and everything that is inside, please welcome to Berdansk. And here it's the only useful port for landing the Russian army or to send some of the supplies. All right, and now let's speak about the possible advancement of Ukrainian army from the Kherson direction. You already know about Regardless, even if they cut off every single port of entry for Russia, the more ports of entry they cut off just limits the spots they have to look. So if they can attack this road, although that port's further, I mean, they'll they'll use more than just cruise missiles likely to attack um, the port. They'll probably send most of their forces or most of their long-range technology at that port because once you cut off the supplies, you could see something a lot like what we saw at the beginning of the war with the 40-mile-long um, Russian, you know, force of tanks and, uh, you know, armored vehicles amongst everything else that they had all stopped and run out of gas and stalled out and then retaken over by Ukraine and that's exactly what it seems like they're working on doing again but even on a larger scale this time about the numerous landing operation attempts of Ukrainian army. One was successful near to Antonovsky bridge, but our guys are under constant fire by the Russian aviation mostly. So we have the bridgehead in this area and the second one already 
over here. I would say that we still may put this landing operation under the question because we are out of clue for how long our guys may hold over there. For sure Russia will send more reinforcements to that area. To counteract that we need to work with our artillery demolishing the Russian forces on their way to attack our guys. Well, speaking in general, is the assault operation of Ukrainian army in this area is possible? I think so, but it is very hard to achieve this goal, basically because of the Dnieper River. So what steps require from Ukraine to achieve this goal of the counterattack operation in this area? First of all, we need to create lots of the bridgeheads on the other shore. Second, we need to build at least one or it's better two of the pontoon bridges across the Dnieper River. Without those bridges, the assault operation is simply not possible. The problem here is that Russia may use their aviation to target those bridges and also artillery systems. So so with the idea of needing to build bridges and to create more ports of entry to cross the Dnieper River uh, to attack the Russian forces, I personally wouldn't imagine it's coming before the muddy season in the next two months. Instead, I would imagine they would do their best to create as many of these bridge entries on these dots that he created as they can, and then F if they can push the Russian forces back enough, um, they'll be able to build those bridges along with air defense systems throughout the muddy season, preparing for a more full-scale assault on Russian forces after the muddy season. Um, the muddy season works both ways. While it'll stall out some of Ukraine's progress, it also allows Ukraine to sit, think, build, and reinforce the areas they want to reinforce and that also allows russia to do the same thing but as we're seeing with the strategy as it unfolds it seems like ukraine is one step ahead of russia so if they can you know keep that pace up then thinking is a good thing for uh ukraine and not as good of a thing for russia in my opinion so how Ukraine may counteract to that by putting some sort of the air defense system, very capable one like Patriot, in this area. Yes, it could be dangerous for the system, but in that case it may cover quite a lot of the distance and partially even Crimea. Russia may try to use their usual tactics with K-52 attack helicopters. They may target the air defense system flying at the low altitude. That is why Ukraine should deploy soldiers with man pads on the other shore together with some sort of the short-range air defense systems. Those are very portable and we have them in Ukrainian army. In that case, Ukraine may secure the pattern bridges and start a massive attack from this place. This is a very profitable direction, actually. Actually, around one month ago I said that this operation is basically not possible because of the Dnieper River and the Russian aviation, but now I see that compared to Zaporizhia direction, this could be the way out for Ukraine to get into Crimea. And that's a very interesting point because Crimea is Ukraine's uh, number one long-term goal. They have forces in other countries training to take back Crimea. Um, my question is how many forces are training because could they not try to attack from both sides? Like if they can push into Russian territory close to Crimea and maybe draw some Russian soldiers from the bottom of Crimea more up towards Ukraine, well, I know you get what I'm saying, then maybe they can bring some forces to the southern part of Crimea and work on the weakened side and kind of, you know, spread out the Russian forces and cause them to not really be prepared for a full-scale attack. It's a hypothetical, but being that we know that there's forces in foreign countries training for uh, the deoccupation of Crimea, I think it's worth thinking about. And the biggest factor for Ukraine are the Russian defense lines. You see, there are not so many in this region compared to Zaporizhia direction, where there are a lot of the defense lines. Nevertheless, Ukrainian army continue to propel 
forward and we're gonna speak about the situation in our rehab direction today but let's first continue with this case this area is mostly a flat ground with no big trees and just few rivers here is the biggest desert actually in ukraine on the north here we have kazachi lahiri where Ukraine just landed. Because of this very flat ground with just few of the natural obstacles, Russia is unable to build their defense lines as they did in Zaporizhia direction. The defense in such terrain require high maneuverability of the defending side, so Russians are unable just to stay in their trenches and wait for Ukrainian army. They have to move, they have to think, because they will be under the constant artillery fire by Ukrainian side. But those maneuvers require loss of the supplies, so let logistics. I would say that in case of the successful landing of Ukrainian army on the other shore across the Dnepr river, they need around five days to reach Crimea in that case. Yeah. Five days? I know he's about to explain what he just said, but we've moved across this river in weeks at least. It's taken... And I know there's not much defense lines here, but there are defense lines. And once you secure this river, they're going to add more defenses, you would imagine. I think five days is a very bold, bold timetable to establish, but I'd like to hear his justification. Yes, the landing operation itself is very difficult and Ukraine may have losses. But we should also count the losses, potential losses, in the Parisia direction. And compare the resources required for the front lines penetration over here or to build the pattern bridges and try to land on the enemy shore with massive forces. Okay, well that, that's a different question you're asking, in my opinion. Um clearly the one that would result in less ukrainian casualties based on this map is the left side attack i don't think that the left side attack is a bad idea i don't think the landing operation is a bad idea i don't think attacking crimea from that closer distance is a bad idea i just don't know that five days is a fair timetable maybe it's not as far as i think maybe it's an easier ground to walk through than i think but there's still if you see those red dots and in between those red dots all those frontline forces they're still there um and it's not like those forces that you can see at the top of crimea can't move upwards just as fast as ukraine can move downwards and there's also that triangle in the middle of the orange part of the battle map that can move over too so i don't i don't know that it would be five days i think that's a dangerous timetable to establish personally in this area but as i said to you before cutting this road and cutting all of that may also influence the situation in zaporizhia front lines without the proper logistics of our enemy it could be easier for ukraine to penetrate the defense lines over here why else do i think that the attack operation from here soon is profitable for ukraine the main target for ukraine is to reach the crimean peninsula we need to eliminate we have talked about that um we have talked about that so we're gonna skip forward a little bit here because it's our grain deal and also metal distribution to the third countries with the black sea marine fleet presented in crimea it is not possible to achieve the third thing as i say to you many times that geographically it's easier to cut out the crimea from the russian supplies and the reason number four is the importance of crimea for the russian federal the reality will into this robot and let's go to the timeline it was yesterday and it is today some changes in this territory the main vector of ukrainian assault goes just between robotina and nova pro to highly recommend you to join my telegram russian artillery at some of the timeline So the rest of the video was overviewing a lot of Crimea and the same landing operation. I think we got a good feel for where the front lines have moved and for the ideas behind the Ukrainian landing operation. Um, a lot of the rest of what could happen is purely speculation and we do want to wait and see what actually happens with uh, Ukraine and their decisions. 
So we want to, um, you know, be careful when establishing timetables. We want to be careful when um, assuming things are going to happen within a war. Uh, this landing operation has started to see some success, and if they can continue to establish ports of entry, we could maybe see a lot of fortification going into the rainy season. Clearly, the idea is to take back Crimea, so going down through that area with less reinforcements is a smart idea. But Ukraine has been slow, and they've been smart about their counteroffensive, and they've been smart about their defensive prowess as well. So I don't see... Ukraine's, you know, sacrificing the front lines on a different side of the map for uh, an invasion on Crimea. And I don't see them rushing in and, you know, taking more casualties than necessary to deoccupy Crimea. I think Ukraine has a plan. I think the muddy season is going to play a very big role in this war, um, especially considering it'll just give a lot of time for strategy. I know they'll still be bombing. I know they'll still be fighting. But at the end of the day, mobilization is going to be slowed to a point where the front lines will likely retake an established form. So I think we're looking at a point with the front lines where we really need to see what ground can be made up to see what ground can be fortified in the coming months. Um, but other than that, I think it was a great video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed my thoughts on it as well. Dennis Dadov always does a great job, so definitely go subscribe to his channel, and if you want to join his Patreon, as you see here, please go do so. He does an amazing work. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in to another uh, Ukraine coverage video and learning more about the front lines and learning about the invasion with me, um, and I hope to talk to you guys again soon. appreciate it, and I hope you have a great day.